uh, to uh, welcome uh, Mr. Robert Mali uh, and Ms. Olga Oliker from International Crisis Group uh, and to discuss uh, today uh, the uh, issues of conflict resolutions, uh, hot conflicts, cold, cold conflicts, so conflicts are conflicts, uh, whatever they are, uh, cold or hot. Uh, so um, Robert has uh, a unique combination of uh, practical and uh, research experience uh, and uh, same can, uh, could be stated about Olga. We have been partnering for a long time and uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome you here at React again. Uh, so uh, I propose the following uh, format of our today's meeting. Uh, I will now uh, give the floor uh, to Robert and to Olga for their introductory remarks and then we will uh, run a Q&A session. Uh, I will be quite strict in terms of timing because uh, we are quite compressed uh, in terms of our schedules uh, our schedule today and we uh, are to uh, finish in uh, uh, in one hour and five uh, minutes so what I would like to ask you in advance not to replace your questions with uh, long statements as we like uh, as we often like to do so now uh, Robert please uh, floor is yours. Yeah, please, please take a mic, uh, push the button. So first, I want to see if you're more effective than an American moderator at holding people to, to questions, because we always fail, so I'll see if <laughs> Russians are more effective. Thank you for, for hosting us. It's a pleasure to be here today um, and to have this discussion with you. This is what we like doing most, which is meeting with people in the countries in which we are, we are doing our work and hearing from you. So I'll try to keep my remarks relatively brief so we can have as much time for the, for the discussion. I want to say a few words about our organization because I realize it may not be familiar to everyone in the room. Uh, we are an international organization. Uh, I happen to be American, but our staff comes from every continent and every country. Uh, uh, our board has members from every country, including uh, Mr. Andre Kortunov, who I think you all are familiar with, but also people from China, from Africa, from Latin America, from Europe, and from the uh, from the Middle East and, and Latin America. And our goal is simple. We're not an ideological organization. We don't have any particular agenda. Our only mandate is to come up with ideas based on the work that we do in conflict areas, whether it's Afghanistan or Venezuela or Syria or Iraq or, or Congo or any country you may think of that has experienced or, or is at risk of experiencing violent conflict. We do work on the ground and our mandate is to come up with practical, pragmatic ideas <coughs> based on our conversations with all the parties in conflict without uh, exclusion, if possible, uh, ideas to resolve, prevent, or mitigate the impact of deadly conflict. So when we say crisis, we really mean deadly conflict, conflict that is costing the lives of, of civilians. Um, and we've been doing that for 25 years, and our hope is to have as open, transparent, and constructive discussions with people in every country. And so we would love, love to spend more time here, particularly as Russia is playing an increasingly central role in a number of the conflicts that we are covering, and Syria obviously comes to mind, but it's, it's not the only one, it just may be the most, uh, the most visible one. And as, as uh, our colleague said, uh, I have the experience of having spent 12 years creating and building the Middle East program of the International Crisis Group, and then spending three years uh, in the Obama administration working on the Middle East and negotiating with my Russian counterparts uh, on Syria, unsuccessfully, but uh, but always uh, always with, with as much uh, effort and goodwill as I could muster. What I want to do today is say a few things, not about specific conflicts that I hope will come up in the question and answer, but about the view that we at Crisis Group hold of the conflict landscape of what is the geopolitical realities today that are influencing conflict trends and will continue to influence them in the years to come. So the way we look at it, there are three transitions taking place. It's sort of like one of these Russian dolls, a transition within a transition within a transition. At the outer layer is a transition in global relations of power. And I don't need to spend too much time on it. I think you are all familiar with it. A relative decline in US influence in world affairs and in its projection of power uh, in, in foreign conflicts for several reasons. One is the natural dynamics of, of, of history, where countries that play a predominant role, including countries that have played a hegemonic role, or what uh, uh, French foreign minister once called American hyperpower, 
they go through cycles of relative decline. It's uh, no, no country can remain at the apex for so long, uh, for, the, for forever. And in this case, there are other countries that have felt the inequities of an international order that they believe has been skewed in favor of the United States and Western countries. I could think of Russia, I could think of China, but I could also think of other countries uh, in the global south who are uh, trying to assert themselves at the same time as the US is, as I said, going through the structural uh, decline, but also accelerated by some of the steps, the overreach of the United States, particularly in, in, in Iraq, uh, arguably in Afghanistan, uh, but particularly in the Middle East where US projection of power has backfired and has led to a feeling among most Americans that it's time to do less around the world. And that has been further accelerated by the peculiar presidency of, of Donald Trump. Um, I think it is a fact that many of the Republicans and Democrats who ran for the presidency in 2016 shared the view that the US was doing too much around the world, that it made too many mistakes around the world, that it wasn't helping the US. And some people felt that it wasn't, even, it wasn't helping the countries in which the US was intervening. And so that was a view from left and right. But President Trump, I think, um, accelerated the process through his very uh, transactional, unilateral view of world affairs, which we can discuss, but which is very much premised on the rejection of the more multilateral order of the past and the notion that the US would uh, be uh, uh, involved uh, in, in all world affairs. He is not. I dispute the notion that the U.S. is retrenching. I think the U.S. is still very active around the world, and I suspect that you here would share that view. But there certainly is a relative, uh, relative decline in its influence, corresponding to a rise in China's influence and to a reassertion of, of, of Russian influence around the world. And that is that challenge, that questioning of the international order, the challenging of some of the multilateral institutions both by the U.S. and by countries that feel that those institutions have not been fairly representative, whether it's the ICC, whether it's the Security Council, whether it's some trade uh, pacts that people around the world feel have been skewed in favor of some against the others. That is having a, an effect on the second layer of this Russian doll, and the second layer is regional politics. And faced with what countries are seeing as a relative vacuum, and again, I, I think one could overstate the case of a vacuum uh, there still are 30,000 American troops uh, in the Middle East. There still is uh, preponderant U.S. influence in Latin America, as we're seeing today in Venezuela. There still is a, a power projection. There is a sense that we're in a transition from one order to another unknown order. And in transitions, regional uh, countries in various regions tend to either try to protect themselves because they face uncertainty or to assert themselves because they sense opportunity. And we're seeing that perhaps most visibly in the Middle East where countries are both fearful of what it would mean to live in a world where the U.S. no longer provides the protective umbrella that it's provided in the past. That's the case of Saudi Arabia. That's the case of the United Arab Emirates. And other countries that sense maybe opportunity uh, at a time when the U.S. influence may be declining, Turkey, Iran, and some doing both. Uh, Israel senses both danger and opportunity. And Saudi Arabia also senses both uh, danger and opportunity. It is both fearful of what the world might look like if the U.S. is no longer there, but also, or no, no longer there in the same capacity, but also an opportunity to flex its muscles and to see how far it can go uh, at, at a time when the region itself is in this period of transition, of flux, of uncertainty, where the rules of the road are not clear. It's not clear how far one could go, and so people are pushing, pushing to test the boundaries. Saudi Arabia is pushing the boundaries. In Yemen, tried to push the boundaries in Lebanon, Israel pushing the boundaries in Syria, Iran pushing the boundaries in various countries around the region, Turkey, of course, in Syria and, and parts of the, uh, the broader Arab world uh, as well. So it's those periods of uncertainty where we're seeing regional powers intervene in other conflicts. Syria, again, is a clear example. Yemen is a clear example. But it's also happening throughout Africa, uh, conflicts uh, like the, what's happening in the DRC, what's happening in, uh, in, in the Horn of Africa, where different countries sensing, again, this, this, this uh, period of flux, are trying to advance their interests or protect their interests by, by waging proxy wars, or at least backing certain proxy actors or certain non-state actors or state actors to uh, press for their, uh, for their uh, advantage. Um, it is also having uh, uh, an impact in, in, in Latin America, where we're seeing 
uh, countries, uh, the the Lima Group trying to figure out, or, or the or the uh, Organization of, of uh, American States trying to figure out how to react in 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 a, in a situation of uh, changing uh, global geopolitics. The third and smallest or, or uh, uh, doll is at the local level, and there too we're seeing a questioning of models of governance that populations feel have been. Uh, iniquitous, have been unequal, have benefited the few instead of the many, uh, that is giving rise to a more populist instinct. That's true certainly in the United States, in the UK, it's true in parts of Central Europe, it's part, it's true one could go further afield uh, in other parts of the world, in, in Latin America, in Brazil, where in the face of, a, of the sense of a world in transition, where uh, traditional institutions are not paying off in the way that they were expected to, where the elites seem to be disconnected from uh, public opinion, there is a, an expression of an sometimes nativism, nationalism, um, as I say, populism, which is having an effect, again, on conflict dynamics, because these countries are, tend to be less, once they're uh, facing domestic unrest, domestic questioning, they're less appetite, less eagerness, less bandwidth, to project their, their influence abroad, or if they do say they do so in a very defensive way to try to protect their interests, not to resolve conflicts. Um, if you travel in Western Europe today, you see less of a capacity to take care of what's happening in, uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, or in Nigeria, or elsewhere around the world, because they are more, they are more preoccupied and their public opinions have less patience for development assistance or for, um, or for political uh, involvement. And the issues on which we're seeing those countries, Western countries in particular, focus on are less political negotiations, diplomacy, or um, development, and more counterterrorism and anti-migration. And those become the lens through which so many of these leaders either voluntarily or are forced to focus, to look at the world, because that's what their public opinions uh, are, are demanding. Now, in the midst of what is a relatively negative uh, landscape for, for an organization like ours that wants to try to convince countries to work together to resolve, prevent, or mitigate the impact of deadly conflict, that believe that diplomacy can often be more effective than military means, including in the fight against terror terrorism, and that believe that, that, that uh, by working together one could uh, address these issues before they become threats to, uh, to their own interests. In the midst of this relatively negative picture, uh, we also see some glimmers of hope. Because as this world order is under siege, and as the traditional Western umbrella uh, is shown to have big holes and rain is and water is coming through, some countries figure that they have to take matters in their own hands and it's going to depend on them whether a conflict is going to escalate or de-escalate, explode, or stay uh, in check. And so we've seen countries come together and uh, try to take matters in their own hands. I could give a few examples where the, a, the work of collectives that, were, that, are, that are outside of the traditional mechanisms have had some success. Let's take the example of Syria. I don't want to call it a successful case by, by, by most measures, but there has been an attempt of countries in the region, Turkey, Russia, Iran, to try to de-escalate the situation. There's been effort, and sometimes with pressure from European countries, Western European countries, to prevent an assault on Idlib, which would have led, in our estimation, to a major humanitarian catastrophe. You have upwards of three million civilians that would have nowhere to go because there is uh, no, there's no, Idlib has been the place where people went for refuge, both jihadists and civilians. And if there's an attack on Idlib, there's no, there's no Idlib for this Idlib, no, no next refuge for the last refuge. Um, there's also been efforts by regional countries, by the UN and others, to avert an assault on the port city of Hodeida in Yemen. We've seen African countries come together to try to navigate the situation in Congo. We're seeing now efforts by regional countries and with the United States, and in this case, the United States' desire to withdraw may have some positive impact, with some risk, in Afghanistan, uh, where regional countries are engaged, where uh, Russia uh, is, 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 is engaged, as we saw in the summit that took place, the meeting that took place here, and where the U.S. is redoubling its efforts of diplomacy on Afghanistan. Um, so, and, and I would mention a last case in the, in the, in the Horn of Africa, where again, in a, in, at this time when they, there was risk and uncertainty, uh, countries in the Horn of Africa came together, Ethiopia, Eritrea, uh, uh, Somalia, Kenya, 
to try to resolve their own, their own problems faced with a prospect that others will not come to their rescue. So there are reasons for hope. I think that the key for us, for an organization like ours, and hopefully we could develop it in a dialogue with an institution, an organization like yours, is to look at these moments of opportunity, understanding that we are in that very risky and uncertain period between an order that is beginning to erode, if not eroding quite quickly, and a new one that has yet to emerge, and that gives the opportunity for countries to step up and to do what we think they need to do to prevent conflicts from escalating and ultimately hurting their own, their own interests. So with that, I'll turn it to Olya, and then I'm happy to take uh, any of the conflicts that I mentioned or that you want to mention. Uh, on the Thank you, Robert. Olga, please. Thank you so much. Um, I am in the always enviable position of being at the, uh, being able to present at the Russian International Affairs Council, which is uh, uh, an organization with which I've been so pleased and so privileged to work uh, in the past, and which does uh, does such important uh, work here in Russia. I'm in the less um, enviable position of following my boss with, uh, making, with making comments on a topic that he has been working on for many, many years and which I have historically addressed from a slightly different perspective. So what I'm going to do is A, keep it brief and B, take it in a somewhat of a different direction. Um, I looked at the questions that were raised for us and the thought I kept having, you know, they're, they're very, um, they're analytical questions, you know, are there, are there rules for how to prevent and manage conflict, for how to keep conflicts from turning hot, uh, what roles do international organizations play, what roles do countries play? And the thought that kept going through my head is that conflicts end when the parties to that conflict determine that the gains from ending the fight are greater than the gains from continuing it. Uh, conflicts can also be prevented by ensuring that parties feel that the costs of conflict are likely to be greater than the gains of conflict. Um, that means that efforts to prevent and mitigate conflict come down to changing the perceived incent uh, incentives for the conflicting parties. Now, there are a few ways you do that, right? There's offering carrots and sticks. There's limiting freedom of maneuver. Um, there's creative approaches to open up the realm of the possible, of creating linkages with other strategic and tactical goals. There's also providing information. Because very often, uh, these decisions on what are the gains and what are the losses are based on the information available, right? Nobody can make a decision or a choice on information other than what's at hand. And other parties uh, can provide additional information that can change the dynamic. And I think this is very much uh, one of the reasons I was excited, excited to join Crisis Group. I think this is the role that Crisis Group often can play. It's by having people on the ground, uh, have, having that capacity to provide information that the parties or prospective parties to a conflict may not have, to better understand what the costs of conflict, and the costs of conflict are almost always high, what the costs of conflict uh, really are. Um, and I think this is, uh, I think this is really important and really interesting, and not always something. I think there, there's an educational purpose also in explaining to stakeholders that this is valuable, that there is such a thing as an unbiased analysis that can inform your position, and you know your intelligence agencies or your friends on the ground may not always have uh, have access to. So I, I think you know one of, um, for my part, I find this uh, this sort of thing very valuable, and I see one of my roles at Crisis Group as uh, sp spreading word that uh, that we can be valuable for this, uh, even for Russia, because as I look at how Russia's role in the world is evolving under these changing conditions that Rob outlined, I see a Russia that is going to be more active um, for the foreseeable future, which is not that far out, but it's far out enough uh, to, to be important and affect us all. And I think Russia is in a position and a growing position to contribute substantially to both stability and conflict mitigation. Now, I'm a Western observer, so you may disagree with me in my assessment of how uh, Russia behaves and looks at the world, and I'd love to hear that. Um, but I, I, I look at what Russia has been doing, including in the Middle East, 
you know, I don't, I think, for instance, and you may agree or disagree, that Russia's initial intervention in Syria was undertaken with a conflict mitigation goal. Now, that's not usually how crisis group would recommend countries try to mitigate conflict, uh, but I think Russia saw a situation in which uh, they believed, uh, that, and I, I think had good reason to believe, that the fall of the Assad government would lead to worse outcomes and more conflict than his remaining in power. And Russia took steps uh, to change that situation. Um, I also look at Russia and its activities in the Middle East, its uh, shuttle diplomacy, as it were, uh, without the shuttle between Iran and Israel. And again, I see a conflict <coughs> mitigation role. Uh, so I think um, I, I would like, uh, as, as we watch Russia evolve, uh, as uh, a power on the global scene that is more active and therefore in a position to take more responsibility, I'm hoping that for my position, the crisis group, that, uh, and for the organization as a whole, that we're able to help inform Russian decisions uh, in doing that just as we do in other places around the world. I, I'll stop there. We can have a conversation either about the underlying theories or the practical matters at hand. Right. Thank you, Olga. Uh, so now uh, we are proceeding with uh, Q&A. So again, I would like to ask you not to replace your questions with long speeches. Пожалуйста, не заменяйте вопросы длительными комментариями. Коллеги, пожалуйста, please, who would like? Михаил Коростиков, коммерсант. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, actually, I have two brief questions. First of all, I cannot uh, but ask you about the fate of one of your employees, Mr. Korik, who was detained in uh, China, as you know, uh, in connection with the Huawei case, or maybe not, uh, you tell me. Uh, and the second question, one of the most pressing issues right now is the uh, issue of uh, DPRK. And there are analysis. Uh, there is analysis that suggests that at some point, with Donald Trump in power, uh, it can uh, like transmit from a uh, like uh, more or less uh, low density conflict to a high density conflict. Uh, do you believe is it po it's possible? And to your mind, uh, are the efforts uh, that are done right now by international community are sufficient to prevent it from uh, becoming a hot spot? Thank you. Should I take one? Uh, okay. First, I really appreciate that you asked the, the, the question about Michael Kovrig. For those of you who don't know, he is one of our employees. He was a senior analyst for Northeast Asia. He lived in Hong Kong, but traveled to China regularly. Um, Chinese authorities respected his analysis. They invited him to give talks. They invited to meet with him, as they do in every country, as we do in, in all of our countries we're in. And the mandate that I give, whether it's Olya here or Anna, who's, uh, if she's in the room, yes, <laughs> is to always operate in full transparency so that the authorities know what we're doing. We have no interest in hiding what we're doing. Everything we do is public. It's on our website. In our meetings, we tell the authorities, here's who we're meeting, here's what we're researching. And that's what Michael did. As you suggest, he became a pawn in a bigger piece. He's a Canadian citizen. He used to be a Canadian diplomat. He left the diplomatic service because he wanted to stay in China and work with us. And he got caught up. I don't want to, I, I, I never like to assume motivations of different state actors, but in this case, he was picked up only days after the daughter of the, the founder of Huawei was uh, arrested in, uh, and detained in Canada uh, to be on, on an extradition request from the United States. She's also the chief financial officer of Huawei. And uh, they started picking up, China picked up an, two Canadian citizens, including Michael Kovrig, and he's been in detention now for 70 days. I think it's 70 days today without access to lawyer, without access to his family, and without any formal charges. Our hope is that once uh, the US and China can, can resolve uh, their trade dispute and perhaps their dispute over Ms. Meng, the, uh, the Huawei executive, that he will also be released because they th there's never been anything against him. They've not made any charges against him. They just say that, I mean, they've said, and the spokesperson has said that he is threatening, undermining Chinese national security. But again, there was nothing against him until this happened. So we know that it's not against our organization. So we're hopeful. And we've asked countries around the world to make, uh, make uh, the case that 
uh, you know, we have argued for engagement with China. We are arguing for people to go to China to, to talk to the Chinese. This doesn't send the best message. So, thank you for the question. I'm very sorry. Can I? Uh, yeah. It's, yes. It's still me. Uh, just follow up. Uh, I heard uh, maybe it's a rumor. You tell me that uh, Kovrig actually didn't leave uh, Canadian Foreign Service, and he had like something like uh, uh, vacation of one or two years. He was so like he that. left. I think the I think the Canadian formal designation is he was on leave, uh, but he worked fully for us and he did not report to the Canadian government. What I don't know is if in three years he decides to go back. What that means, every foreign service maybe in Russia they have their own rules, but we told him he cannot be in any way reporting to the Canadian government. Uh, he's reporting to us. So and then the, again the the Chinese have not you know if he was still working for them then he'd have diplomatic immunity, but he doesn't. So. Mm -hmm. Um, so the DPRK, I, you know, I'm not, as you may have sensed from what I said, I'm not usually somebody who is a, a, a huge fan of President Donald Trump. I don't always uh, defend what he does. I think he did the right thing when it came to North Korea. I think, engage, as I said earlier, uh, uh, our organization believes in dialogue. It believes in dialogue with everyone and the notion that by not talking to Kim Jong-un, you were somehow punishing them and that you were uh, moving forward didn't make sense to us. And so... The fact that he sat down and had this summit with, uh, with Kim Jong-un was a positive development. Of course, one can say that he de-escalated a crisis that he created, because of course in the first year of him in office, in talking about uh, uh, Little Rocket Man and, talking about, and, and, and speaking in very negative terms and in ways that made people think that maybe war was around the corner. So he escalated the crisis, but then he withdrew from it and he walked back. And again, there's no reason from our point of view to criticize it. I would say I think his expectations for what will happen in these negotiations, or at least the expectations of some of his advisors, are uh, excessive. We don't believe that uh, the DPRK is going to denuclearize anytime soon. It might happen if security conditions in the peninsula and in the region change quite dramatically. But for now, I think the best we can do, and it's not little, is a f freeze and, and, and some steps to walk back the nuclear and missile program in exchange for some easing of the sanctions and perhaps... Um, depending on how far North Korea goes, a uh, declaration of the end of, of a formal declaration of the end of war. For us, for me, that would be a positive outcome. It would be better than than where we were. And you know, again, one could criticize it. And experts have said this doesn't go far enough. It's certainly less than what the Iran nuclear deal that he tore up, that President Trump tore up, uh, did. But it's better than where we were, and at least it puts us on a path where things could get uh, even better. Um, it is a style of President Trump to, to try to get big bang agreements with, which are not necessarily that deep. But I would not be surprised if between now and 2020 when President Trump will run for re-election, he would like to run on a platform that says, I told you I, I would leave Afghanistan, I left Afghanistan. I told you that I would reach a deal with, uh, with North Korea, we have a deal with North Korea. I told you we'd get better trade terms with China, I suspect there will be a trade deal with China. I told you we withdraw from Syria, we withdrew from Syria, and he will try to present himself as having, and I told you I would leave the Iran nuclear deal and move the capital to, of Israel to Jerusalem, the, the embassy, and he will be able to say, he will want to be able to say in 2020, I did everything I said I would do. Mm -hmm. Thanks. No questions? <coughs> Up to three questions. So, first of all, um, and this is to Mr. Malley, um, Russia has shown a tentative signs of interest in Africa and get involved in failed spikes like CAR on uh, getting business deals through. I was just wondering if you could uh, elaborate on, on what you see uh, uh, Russia's role in Africa and whether it can um, facilitate or, or actually make it. Uh, harder to achieve uh, peace and stability on that continent. And second, brief, brief question, just to follow up on, on the Iran uh, thing. Do you envisage maybe future American administrations coming back into the uh, Iran deal, or if, and uh, if not, what do you, uh, what do you see as the, the future of the, of the situation with the Iran? The uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for very good questions as well. I think you're right that uh, Russia is more active on the African continent. There's actually a piece today in the Financial Times uh, that tries to uh, look at, I'm interested in how people's reaction to it, but talking about uh, Russia's new role. And I think you mentioned certainly the Central African Republic. I think Libya, you could 
it's Africa or it's Middle East, it depends, how, but it's North Africa, um, and potential role uh, elsewhere. The answer to your question, it could be productive, it could be negative. I think in the Central African Republic, the concern that we were hearing from the African Union was that Russia was getting involved, in fairness, at the request of the, of the, of the government, and also uh, involved with some of the rebel groups, because it, off it offered security uh, cooperation to the president, but it also um, had, had, had channels to, to the rebel groups. I think there was a concern on the part of the African Union that this was undermining their own diplomacy, their own efforts by creating a parallel uh, channel which could lead different groups to, to decide which one they was to the benefit. I think it was a positive that they unified the Everton Khartoum. An agreement was just signed. It is a fragile agreement. It's unclear uh, whether it will hold, but it's better than not having any agreement at all. And I think it was a, a case where uh, the concern about Russia perhaps working with Sudan in one direction it was channeled, and I think uh, very smartly by having the talks being held in Khartoum, it managed to merge those two efforts. So that's a case where, conceivably, Russia uh, uh, could play a positive role. Again, I don't, we'll have to see where that goes and, and what other interests, and you know, to speak candidly, there are commercial interests that are involved, certainly in the case of the Central African Republic, and to make sure that those don't detract from the need to, pr to, to resolve the conflict. Um, Libya is another case where it appears that, that, uh, that Russia has been more interested. Our concern there would be, is Russia weighing, putting its thumb on the scale in the favor of one of the parties in conflict, in particular, in, in this case, uh, General Heftar, um, with which maybe Russia feels more uh, ideological or political affinity, but uh, is probably not good for the stability of the country. We don't, we don't think that General Heftar should be excluded by any means, but there should be a resolution that brings together all of the parties and all of the tracks, political, security, and economic, whether it's those in Tripoli, in Misrata, in Benghazi, in Tobruk, to make sure that the uh, that you don't uh, that, that they move together, that they agree on a new uh, you know, new constitution, new new elections, uh, rather than resolve this militarily. So again, a case where Russia, if it plays the role of mediator and of and and, and of sort of honest broker, rather than backing one side against the other, it could, it could be uh, positive. And there are other cases. I mean, Russia has an important role in Sudan. How is it going to play it? Is it going to play it in a way that is going to lead to a more peaceful uh, resolution of the political crisis uh, or not? So there's no right or wrong answer. I think, as, as Olya said, our, we, we, our goal is to try to work with, persuade, even when we'll have differences, and we'll have many with Russia, as we do with most uh, countries. We never have perfect alignment that uh, there are some policies that could lead that would be better for its interests and better for the interests of the countries in which they are, uh, you are involved. Iran, another very good question. Um, first, a word on where we are today. Uh, obviously, after the U.S. withdrawal from the deal, it has become more difficult for Iran to, to stay in. It's, 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 it was a bargain, and I, I helped to negotiate the deal when I was at the White House, spent uh, many months in Vienna uh, negotiating together with Russia. This is a very good case where Russia, the United States, China, the EU, and, and the E3 worked very well together. Um, and I don't think there would have been a deal, frankly, without some very critical interventions by Foreign Minister Lavrov at, at key moments. Uh, but it was a case where the deal was freeze the, 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 and, and ro rolled back the nuclear program in exchange for the lifting of sanctions. At this point, one side is living up to its deal and one party uh, is not. And so uh, Iran every day has to make the calculus. Is it worth staying in the deal and, and uh, being burdened by the nuclear constraints without, without fully de benefiting from the economic uh, um, uh, counterpart? So far, their conclusion has been yes, and we think at Crisis Group that it's the right conclusion. And it's the right conclusion because, number one, some countries, including the European Union, and they just established this INSTEX, this special purpose vehicle to facilitate commercial exchanges, at least humanitarian, uh, on the humanitarian front with, with Iran, but Russia, China, and other countries have continued to engage economically with Iran. So it's given Iran a modest, much less than what they expected, but a modest economic benefit, and big di diplomatic and political benefit, because they can now say that they are aligned with Europe against uh, the United States rather than see Europe and Europe against them. And that's one reason uh, that they're staying. And the other reason they're staying is that they think maybe it's only another two years. And then, and that comes to your question, and then a new president perhaps will be elected in the United States and things will change. I don't know what will happen in the United States in 2020. 
Uh, I lost a lot of money betting uh, the wrong way in 2016, so I'm not going to make any bets uh, this time around. We're a very unpredictable country. Um, but I think it is true that if a Democrat is elected in 2020, he or she will have a different attitude towards Iran. All the declared candidates today have said that, and the undeclared candidates probably will go in the same direction. Whether they will re-enter the deal right away or they want to have some conversation with Iran beforehand, I'm not sure. Our recommendation as our organization is that the next president should, if there's a next president after, I mean, if it's not President Trump, should say that they will re-enter the deal unconditionally, but then tell the Iranians, you've seen, this is a fragile deal. It's very controversial in the United States. There are many issues that were not part of the deal that are raising questions. Uh, let's talk and let's see whether we could strengthen the deal. There's some things you don't like about it, some things we don't like about it. Let's keep the deal, but let's try, use the next year, a little bit more perhaps, uh, to try to, to, to bolster the deal. That would be our recommendation, and at least one or two presidential candidates have already said that would be their approach. And our argument to the Iranians when we meet with them, and I just met with uh, Foreign Minister Zarif a few days ago, our argument is it would be a big mistake for them to walk away from the deal because Europe would reimpose sanctions immediately and Iran would be isolated again. UN. Far smart, and the UN as well, far smarter for them to stay with the deal, see as much as they can get, and then if another president is elected, see what happens. If President Trump is re-elected, I think then the, the dynamics will change and Iran is going to have to think very hard about what, is, what it wants to uh, what it wants to do, whether it's prepared to re-enter negotiations with the U.S. or whether it wants to leave the deal. That's, uh, I don't know how they will think this through. But for now, I think we are still in a position where the uh, Iranian system, the Iranian regime as a whole, although it's not unanimous, but as a whole they've decided, let's stick with the deal, let's see what Europe and others can, can get to us in terms of economic benefits. Let's hold our breath and wait another two years. Mr. Lagora, you wanted to, to make a comparison. Thank you very much. Olga, you referred to incentives. <clears throat> I will try to maybe go a little bit more into theory. Is it enough to tackle incentives, or are we in a period, as you presented, uh, of uh, such a complexity that what is challenged is a philosophical problem of rules? legitimacy and legality. And if that's the case, I think we are going to have a lot of problems because incentive is not enough. We have to try to address those philosophical misunderstandings or differences at the philosophical level. Thank you, Ambassador. So I might argue that rules, legitimacy, and legality are a form of incentives that if there is a system in place that um, everyone agrees to abide by, then one of the incentives to keep abiding by it is that uh, failing to do so will result in retribution from those who do believe in that system. The system falls apart when people stop abiding by the rules. I mean, it's, um, every international agreement is signed because the parties to that agreement have decided that they're willing to be bound by it in order to bind the other parties. It falls apart when one or another party decides that they're not willing to do it, right? International law is something we agree to. It's not something that's imposed from without. Um, is that falling apart? I think it's, I do think, first, we might exaggerate the extent to which it worked uh, sometimes. Uh, some people have always felt more bound by these rules than others. I do think that um, a lot, we're, we're seeing more parties, more countries willing to test the boundaries and to see what happens. How that plays out, you know, I, my standing joke, which some people in this room may have heard, is that as a political scientist, I don't predict the future. I explained that it was inevitable after the fact. Um, <laughs> Things are going to change, right? This is the future I predict. How they shift around, I am less capable of predicting. International organizations, international law, orders, I think are shifting around uh, with, with these uh, forces <coughs> that Rob described. Um, if you want to hold on to them or you want to build new ones, I mean, that's, uh, I think that's the challenge going forward, which isn't a terrific answer to your question. But I suppose I stand with you that I, I do think that the system as people believed it to be 
is weaker than it was. I mean, if I could add a few, because that's a very important question. And I wrote, actually, the, the piece I wrote, we, every year we have a piece called 10 Conflicts to Watch. And I wrote an introductory essay, and it, and it tries to address some of this issue, I think. And, and Olya already touched on it already and, and answered to a large extent. Um, I think it's true that there's an erosion of rules, norms, uh, um, rules of the road, and, and rules of conduct. As Olya said, those were we could be overly nostalgic, and I don't think people in Russia are necessarily nostalgic, but people in the West sometimes are nostalgic. They paint a picture of a rules-based international order, which was not particularly international because it was skewed in favor of some. It was not that orderly because there was a lot of violence. And the rules themselves were sometimes uh, followed a la carte. I mean, it really depended. And so, uh, you know, and we could go down the list of where the erosion of those norms uh, uh, began. But it is true that today there seems to be an acceleration. And one could go through the list of, you know, whether it's use of chemical weapons in Syria, whether it's the murder of journalists, whether it's the um, interventions. And on all sides, I mean, there's obviously the U.S. intervention in Iraq, uh, the U.S. involvement in Syria, which is of some questionable legality, even though I was part of that decision-making process. Russian intervention in Ukraine, I'm sure there'd be a debate here about uh, how you would view that. The use of sanctions, extraterritorial sanctions by the US, that goes back some time, but now that they're more, they are more controversial because the world is no longer what it was when the US first in the 90s uh, uh, started using it. Use of cyber warfare, uh, electrical interference, again, I'm sure there'd be a debate here about who's done what, but, that, but I think on all these issues, it's, it's much harder now to claim uh, uh, reference to norm and say, you should stop doing what you're doing because of this norm, because somebody will always find the counter, find the counter example. And yesterday at the Munich conference, uh, Foreign Minister Zarif was asked repeatedly about Iran's performance on human rights, and his answer to every question had, was one word, Khashoggi. Every question he said, in fact, he said, you can't talk about human rights anymore because of Khashoggi, which is a quite extraordinary statement. I, don't, I, I, I know and, and have dealt uh, often with uh, Foreign Minister Zarif, he's a a very subtle, sophisticated man. I don't think that was the best answer, but it was indicative of this notion now that, well, nothing works anymore, and there's no norms that we can appeal to because there's so much hypocrisy and double standard. So I think that perception, which has always been true to some extent, has accentuated. Now, does that mean that the incentive structures, you say, that we can't use it anymore? I would say that we have to, we're going to have to reinvent some of these norms. We have to reinvent some of these rules. But in the meantime, the core incentives that Olio spoke about, which is the cost-benefit incentives. Are people, is Russia better served, uh, I'll take one example, by uh, backing a Syrian regime assault on Idlib, or is it better served by some kind of diplomacy? Uh, is, is, is the US better served by maintaining its forces in Afghanistan or by some kind of diplomatic uh, arrangement? Now, these may not appeal to norms and rules, but to basic cost-benefit structures is it is it and that's what in the end i think is going to have to um, be the core arguments from venezuela to uh to uh, sudan or somalia or to uh, afghanistan or syria which is can we as an organization and can those in this room who want to be part of that as well can we based on our understanding of what's happening on the ground make a convincing case that there's a better way to promote whatever the nation state's interest is by moving away from conflict and towards diplomacy rather than thinking that you could uh, get your way through, through warfare. Okay. Yes. Uh, Alex, let me go for the next for it. We have uh, Rob, all the thank you for uh, insightful comments. I have uh, several questions. Uh, we're going to be uh, on this, actually. Uh, focus more on that one. So the first thing is about the uh, intra-GCC uh, tensions mainly between Saudi Arabia and Qatar. So how do you see the, uh, these dynamics and where it will lead the, uh, the formation and actually the regional dynamics? Uh, the second one is about uh, Israeli-GCC relations. So as we know, in the last years, they're I mean, constantly warming up. Israeli security uh, officials traveling to the GC states, um, negotiations are ongoing. So how do you see those, um, those developments? And the final question is uh, about um, how do you see uh, the US approach towards Turkey and its role 
uh, in uh, in Astana format in Syria and uh, like post US withdrawal from Syria if it happens. Ultimately, thank you. Thank you. Great again. Great series of questions. So. On the GCC, GCC tensions, I'd say, I'd look at it at two levels. In terms of its immediate impact, when I now travel, I was in Qatar recently, in UAE recently. It's a fact of life. It's part of the furniture. They've learned to live with it. They don't, the Qataris don't particularly like it, but they've done quite well, actually, uh, diplomatically and economically. They, they, they've survived. And even on the football pitch, they've now done quite well against the UAE and Saudi Arabia. So I sense, and particularly after the Khashoggi murder, they feel much more confident. Um, uh, and so it's not really affecting, it's having some effect in some places. For example, in the Horn of Africa I mentioned, their rivalry is spilling over in Somalia in ways that are unhelpful. They may spill over in other places. But So I don't think that this is going to have a decisive impact. I think there's a bigger question, which is what does it reflect? And part of what it's reflecting today is, you know, so many of us, myself included, are focused on the conflict between Iran and Saudi Arabia, between Sunnis and Shiites. And in some ways, yes, it's a very important one, and we are worried about a possible co conflict involving Iran. But from a Saudi perspective, and from the perspective of some other countries, Saudi, UAE, maybe Egypt, the more long-term threat doesn't come from Iran. It's a minority uh, sectarian group. It's, it, it doesn't compete on the same field. It's Turkey. It's the Muslim Brotherhood. And Qatar is part, in their view, of that. They're really the real competitor, historically and going forward, for the hearts and minds of, of Sunnis uh, around the region. And I think this, that's, for me, the, the most important, the most relevant question, is how is the region now going to structure itself in terms of that dynamic, whether it's in Syria, whether it's uh, or around the, the region, how is that dynamic going to unfold? And it's no coincidence, and this brings me, we'll, we'll come back to Astana in a minute, it's no coincidence that Turkey and Iran have found ways, thanks to Russia, to work together in Syria, even as Turkey and Saudi Arabia and Iran and Saudi Arabia have not. So I think it's a very it's it's a dynamic that at least in some some countries people tend to underestimate, which is this the real friction that exists now within the Sunni world between different strands, and that is that is having a very negative effect in Libya, it's having a negative effect in Syria, it's having a negative effect in Tunisia, it's having a negative effect around the, around the world in very, in very profound ways. Israel GCC, very quickly, I mean, the interesting thing is that what is motivating the rapprochement is also what's inhibiting it. What's motivating it is Iran. And so now there is the Iran factor, I don't want to underestimate it too much, but GC, some GCC countries, and it's always kind of the, not exactly the same, it is UAE, Bahrain, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, also in this case, um, to some extent, uh, Oman, but I think Oman has different reasons for doing it. They believe that they, could, they will have more in common, at some level, security-wise, uh, strategically-wise, with Israel, if it could, and, and to align themselves or to work together with them, and we just saw some evidence of it in Warsaw, uh, against Iran. But it's also the inhibitor, because they know that their public opinions, which would be further uh, animated by what Al Jazeera says, or what Iran says, or what Hamas says, what Hezbollah says, or what Turkey says, that they know that if they go too far in that direction, they risk uh, a, a blowback, delegitimization at home. So I think they're torn, and which is why they're making several steps forward and then one step back. Warsaw was a perfect example. They were there, they met with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, then they tried to somewhat cover their tracks because it became a bit embarrassing when there was the uh, leak of the video. Um, so I think we're going to see this, certainly the, the, the trend line is clear. There's going to be better relations uh, between, um, uh, between the Gulf countries and Israel, and there's some, you know, Bahrain and, 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 and as I said, Oman broke the ice a bit, and I think we'll see more of it. But as long as you have this polarization in the region, as long as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is where it is today, I think there'll be an inhibition, a, a concern among some uh, not to go too far. And in Saudi Arabia, it's very much the king, who I think has... Uh, uh, suggested strongly to his son, uh, the, the, the crown prince, not to go too far too fast. Finally, on, on, on U.S. Uh, U.S. Turkey, um, so the Astana format has been successful in, in terms of the, you know the interests of its participants. Uh, clearly, it's not to the U.S. liking because Iran is part of it, and because of the the, the issue of of, of Turkey. Um, you know, the U.S. has a very love-hate relationship with Turkey. It's a very, it's a very, one of those intriguing relationships. I was in the middle of it uh, during my years in the administration. 
uh, every administration is divided between those who believe that Turkey as a core NATO member, a powerful NATO member, a country that they don't want to see slip away and go on the other side, whether it's the Iranian side or the Russian side, that we need to privilege that relationship. And others who believe that Turkey can't be trusted, certainly not under Erdogan, President Erdogan, uh, that uh, uh, they are, um, you know, for both domestic and regional reasons, they're not a country that we should be as closely aligned to. And that played out in terms of the support for the YPG, for the PYD, the Kurds in Syria. And the line of those who felt, not necessarily, they weren't necessarily anti-Turkish, but they felt that Turkey may not be as trustworthy as they would want it to be, and that the priority was the fight against Daesh, they decided let's put our, our eggs in the, in the Kurdish basket. I think that's what we're, the, 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 what we're seeing now play out in northeast uh, uh, Syria is once again this debate. And it is going to be a competition in a way, a tug of war between Russia and, and Turkey, well Russia, which is going to try to convince mm -hmm. Turkey, I suspect, I believe, to accept some kind of deal between the government in Damascus and the Kurds. And we know what the outlines would be, some return of the state to create a buffer, a, a, a Syrian state buffer between the Kurds and, and Turkey. And the American appeal to Turkey, which is no, that's not the right way. Let us work with the Europeans to create a buffer between Turkey and the Kurds, but the buffer would be a Western US supported buffer, not a Russia government supported buffer. Um, it's not clear where this will end and whether in the end Turkey or, or, or the Kurds will trust the, I'm going to simplify it, the Russian gambit or the, or the U.S. gambit. And part of it will be a, a, a reflection of the state of Turkish-U.S. relations. Um, President Trump has, has, and President Erdogan have tried to repair the relationship. It's only gone so far, but it's better than it was a few months ago, but it still is a very complicated one because on so many levels the interests and the values are not currently... Uh, Aligned, but I think we will see. We will. One will have to look at what happens in northeast Syria as a good indication of where President Erdogan uh, believes he wants to go. Mm -hmm. Okay, no questions. No, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Joseph Rabina. I'm a PhD candidate at Kimo University, and I'd like to ask you how do you perceive latest U.S. unilateralism, such as uh, uh, withdrawal from INF. Iran, Iran deal, and even claims about the uncertain future of New Start. Is it part of uh, some kind of strategy for containing China, the growth of Chinese and Russian influence in the world, or what's your notion about that? Thank you. I'm going to take that in I'll take that in yeah, Take that in there first. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I'll. I'll... So. Over the course, this, this will get to INF, I promise. Uh, over the course of my career, um, working in uh, working with Russians, working with representatives of Russia's neighbors, working um, in the Middle East, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, working in Africa, I've come across uh, something I started calling the myth of American competence, which is this belief that whatever it is the United States is doing, it has a plan. And that plan might be about global domination, it might be about the price of oil, it might be about markets. Everything will fit into that plan. So people went to remarkable lengths to torture American actions until it fit a, they fit a plan. When, as often as not, American actions were driven by misperception, by a lack of adequate information, and by bad judgment. Um, I find it stunning that there are people who pers persist in believing in the myth of comp American competence even now. I, I do think overall it's died down a little bit. I think withdrawing from the INF Treaty is a tremendously bad judgment on the part of the United States. Um, the treaty is out of date. Uh, the treaty has its problems. But here's the thing, and it goes back to this concept of rules and legitimacy and legality. If you want to have a system in place that constrains others, it has to also constrain you. And that means that if you think it's out of date, if you think it no longer meets your needs, you don't just walk away from it. You go to the table and you try to think through ways to update it. If you 
if you do think it needs to be jettisoned entirely but you want to maintain a relationship in the system, you get together with the other parties to that agreement and you do that together rather than unilaterally withdraw. And I think that's, that's what makes this a bad judgment because in withdrawing from the INF Treaty, the United States has dragged down the prospects for arms control more broadly. In questioning the value of New START, it does the same thing. And I think that's in the long term going to be dangerous. So let me, again, building on, on what Olya said, it's, I mean, in some ways this is a very heterogeneous administration. It's a very strange one because you have people who are around the president who basically don't share his views. I mean, some of them have resigned, some of them are still there. But, you know, he, he campaigned on the notion of uh, against these foreign wars, and some of the people, particularly beforehand, but even now, around him, were big proponents of the Iraq war, big proponents of staying in Afghanistan. We saw in the case of Syria how virtually everyone around him rebelled against his decision and tried to walk it back. So it's hard, again, it's not just a myth of, 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 of American competence, but of, of American strategy in this case because there's so many different views. What I think you have to try to, un, you know, I'm trying to unpack what, where we are now. So it starts with the, for, for Trump, for President Trump in particular, I think what animates him is he's a very unilateral transactional uh, person. He doesn't believe, why, why does he not believe in alliances and multilateralism? Because he thinks that it dilutes U.S. interests. I mean, it's, it's quite simple. He, for example, he believes that if you deal with the EU as EU, it's bad for the U.S. because you're dealing with more countries and so their powers, he prefers to deal with them one by one. He thinks that if the U.S. enters into multilateral commitments, by definition, the U.S. can't get everything or it can't get its way because it has to, you know, it has to placate others and, 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 and make sure that their interests are at the table. So he would prefer, I don't think, so I don't think it's a contain Russia or China strategy. I mean, in fact, for him, if China or Russia did what they needed to do in their interest, but it didn't affect U.S. interests, I don't think you would have a problem. And I'm maybe going to say something controversial here. I think that's why one of the reasons, and many other reasons people speculate about, I don't want to speculate. I think for him, Russia doesn't, Russia doesn't threaten, doesn't hurt the U.S. economically. China does because of its, its, its trade uh, surplus or deficit for the U.S. perspective. So he's much tougher on China on those issues. Russia, you know, with their being in Ukraine, Syria, that's not the kind of transactional thing. He's not interested in sort of overall power projection. He's interested in what he can count. There's a, the, you know, the famous statement by, uh, I think it was uh, Einstein, uh, the only thing that counts can be counted and only things that can be counted count. I think that's very much President Trump's view. Can he count it? And if he can't, these amorphous notions of values, of international system, of multilateral alliances, they don't really mean much to him. So I don't think that for him, it's containing others. It's, is the US, is it a win for the US? Um, some people around them have a different view. And so what you end up is a, bizarre, heterogeneous uh, uh, mix. For, for John Bolton, he has been animated, and Olio would know this better by me than, than I am, than I know it, by opposition to arms control deals. As people have said, he's never seen an arms control deals that he likes. So, you know, th there was this overlap between President Trump's notion, I don't like multilaterals, I don't like these deals. Bolton, who convinced him probably that the INF was bad for the U.S., and he, it's tying our hands, China can do what it wants, so we can't, Russia's cheating, we're not. So why not? He, he doesn't have any affection for those deals. In the case of Iran, I think it was, in that case, it was his own, you know, he had pledged to leave the deal. It was an anti-Obama uh, thing. And there's some people around him who are animated by the desire of regime change in Iran. So, you know, I think President Trump himself is pretty, pretty predictable, actually. If you, if you read what he said through his lifetime, his instincts are predictable. And then it's a matter of who can try to steer him in, in a direction that is, consistent if not completely aligned with his interests, with his, with his world view. Um, so I don't think there's a theory around this. The result is pretty clear. It's a walk away from multilateralism, from TPP to the Paris Accord, to the Iran deal, to the INF, and there probably are more to come. I mean, I don't know, uh, you know, in this country, there, again, there may be a different view, but um, NATO is not necessarily off the chopping board in this sense. Not, I don't think the US is gonna withdraw from NATO. But it is at least out there, and particularly if I, when I travel to, to Western Europe, people are very concerned about this, from their perspective, again, not necessarily a Russian perspective, that it will be more of a transactional deal. Those countries that don't meet the 2% uh, 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 threshold will not benefit as fully from Article 5 collective defense. So these are the, I think you have to take his instincts and then try to see who around him is going to be able to influence him in one direction or the other. But from his perspective, I think this explains why he 
is almost alone in his view of Russia. Again, there are other explanations that I don't, I, I really don't know. But on this, he doesn't see a reason why Russia is, is, is hurting American interests, and some people around him, and certainly in Congress, and Democrats, and everyone else does. And so he, is, he has been unable at this point to, to steer U.S. policy in the direction I think he might want to go on Russia. I don't know if you agree with that, because we haven't discussed it, but... Uh... Yeah, I, 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 I agree. I, I think that Donald Trump has a fairly consistent worldview. The people around him uh, do not, and it's where, where we're going to end up on Russia is uh, it's still not entirely clear as a result of it. For, for, folks, we got uh, five minutes left, so I'm taking I'm taking last question. Please, Anton. Thank you. Thank you, Anton Grishin, from the Federation Council for Russia. Be uh, careful. I have a question on Eastern Ukraine because you haven't mentioned it. I'm a great fan of uh, your work, but uh, there were no reports on Eastern Ukraine recently after the arrival of Ms. Solikar. There's going to be uh, much more new information. But actually, what is the strategy? Uh, what is uh, the approach of American administration? We haven't seen uh, anything for recent year. Wes Mitchell hasn't even visited Moscow, I guess, and Kurt Walker as well. So the conflict is effectively frozen, and the Ukraine is, uh, seems to be satisfied with it, and is not to, it, it doesn't want the uh, United States to be uh, much more uh, actively involved, I guess. But it's okay with the uh, United States just uh, uh, keeping sanctions in power. But uh, how do you think the United States uh, can uh, resolve this conflict? Uh, are there any prospects for Washington to be involved much more and to, to pro propose some new solutions? Or we need to wait for next president if he or she is going to be <coughs> much more uh, com compromised with <laughs> her So what, what's your view? What's your view? Will there be more reports? Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, that, that's, the, that's the easy one. Um, administration strategy. Well, Wes Mitchell's no longer in the administration, so uh, I suppose he could come to Moscow, but it wouldn't make much of a difference. Um, Kurt Volker, I'm told that the discussions uh, between uh, him and his Russian counterparts continue and are fairly consistent. Um, whether they get you anywhere or not is, a, is another question. I think that U.S. policy on Ukraine uh, fits the characterization that Rob laid out about U.S. policy more generally. Uh, moreover, I think, uh, you know, I think this has been the case with a lot of U.S. policy because you have an administration that has a tendency to change course. People have over the last two and, uh, two and a half years, or two years and a little bit, what they've done is they either continue with what they've got, so you know, you've got a strategy that that's left over from the previous administration, you're gonna keep implementing it. You try to guess what the White House wants and implement that, or you actually have some marching orders from the administration and you implement those. In the case of Ukraine, it's mostly the first and a little bit of the second, and that's in keeping with what a lot of the people around Donald Trump want, which is uh, pressure on Russia and a certain amount of support for, for Kiev. Um, Kiev is going to take whatever support it can get from whoever is going to give it the support. And I think Kiev um, wants globally, I mean, I think their, their goal is more pressure on Russia. I would argue that in the end, resolution of the conflict, it's not something the United States delivers. It's something that Kiev and Moscow deliver. Uh, the United States isn't a party to this conflict. The United States can't resolve this conflict. The United States can't make decisions on behalf of the Ukrainian government or of the Russian government. Um, European uh, leaders, American leaders, can try to facilitate agreements and arrangements. They can try to change incentives for the parties, which you know, the, the sanctions uh, pressure on Russia is an effort to change incentives for Russia. Um, you could make arguments about incentives that could be placed in front of the Ukrainians as well, um, particularly if, if uh, one has goals for Ukraine for 
reform agenda or whatever else, but that's not necessarily related to this, uh, to this war. Um, I don't, so I, I don't think the United States has a very clear sense of what it wants. Um, I have visions of how, you know, what would be good and what would be bad from this conflict. Uh, I don't think, and I, th I don't think that Russia necessarily has been acting in its own best interest, even taking all the sanctions aside, to, you know, sanctions or no sanctions. I don't think a war uh, in Ukraine with Ukraine is in Russia's best interests. And I, th I also think that uh, incentives for Ukraine to think about how it would integrate Eastern Ukraine uh, would be helpful from a variety of parties. And Russia's in a position to put Ukraine to make Ukraine think about that a lot harder than it has been thinking. Uh, you know, so I would, enc I would encourage Russia and Ukraine to be at the table more and rely on outside parties slightly less uh, mm -hmm. for this particular conflict. Mm -hmm. Robert, would you like to add something? OK, so uh, we are precisely in time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Olga. Thanks to all of your questions. Thank you for coming.